again, a lot of YouTube channels have videos about vehicle alternators, but very few do a good enough job explaining to viewers in a very simple way exactly how they work and how to test them. After watching this video, you'll have a very good understanding. Right here you see a typical alternator that is used to charge your battery. The reason why it's called an alternator is because when the pulley is rotated by the vehicle's engine, it produces an AC or alternating current output that switches between positive and negative pulses. That output is then transformed into a DC or direct current output that is used to charge your battery. Now before I open up this alternator so you can see each of the components inside and I'll show you how to test them as well, let me first point out everything on the outside of the alternator. Right over here is your pulley. In this case it's for a flat grooved belt. You may have a V-groove pulley. In order for an alternator to produce reasonable current to charge your battery, this needs to be rotating around 2000 RPM. So if the typical vehicle is idling at 700 RPM, you need this to spin a lot faster while the vehicle's idling. And that's why the pulley is much smaller than your crankshaft pulley, which is usually about six or seven inches in diameter. For every one rotation of the crankshaft pulley, this will rotate probably three times. So you're going to have a three to one ratio so if it is idling around 7 or 750 RPM, this pulley here will be spinning around 2100 to 2200 RPM, giving you a reasonable output to charge your battery while the vehicle is idling. Full output for alternators is usually around 6 or 7000 RPM at this pulley. In this case, this is an 80 amp alternator. If your vehicle's engine is at a very high RPM on the highway, you can see the alternator pulley spinning up to 10,000 RPM or more. This pulley is connected to what is called a rotor. The rotor is an electromagnet. There's windings inside of that rotor. When current is applied, a magnetic field is generated within the stator. The power to charge your battery comes off of the stator, which wraps all the way around. Right behind the pulley, right over here on the inside, is a bearing. Sometimes you'll hear an alternator when it's revving at a high speed making a whining sound and that's usually because this bearing here or the one on the other end is faulty and needs to be replaced. Okay let me turn this around. We'll take a look at the opposite end now. Over here is the charging output from the stator. This gets connected to your battery and right over here is the harness connected to the internal voltage regulator. Right over here inside these openings, that's your rectifier diodes. It takes the AC output from the stator and converts it to direct current. Now when I open up the unit, you're going to observe that the stator has three sets of windings. And the reason for that is because it's a three-phase output, and that's what alternators use. The reason why they use them is because they're much more efficient and have a greater power output. Right over here is a sine wave if you only had one winding inside that generator. Over here, there's no voltage, zero. When it moves upward, it's generating positive voltage. And when it goes down from the line to here, it's creating negative voltage. So right over here, as the alternator is spinning, positive voltage is going to be generated. Once it reaches that peak, it's going to start falling down. And from this point here, down to here, you're not going to have any power generated. Once it reaches the zero line, it's going to start producing a negative voltage to this point here. Then no output is going to be created from the bottom here up to the zero line. And that pattern is going to repeat over and over. With the three phase output, you can see the first phase is producing a positive voltage up to this point right here. And then once it's getting ready to start coming down, and produce absolutely nothing in the way of power, you have a second phase that's already generating power up to this point here. So as this one's dropping, this one is building up to power again. And then as this one drops, this one builds to power again. And the same thing repeats at the bottom. Here you're producing a voltage. And while you're not producing anything right here, this one is producing a negative voltage. The way the stator is wound 
is in a star or Y configuration. Looks like a Y, you can see right here. There's three sets of windings, like I previously mentioned. So one goes from here over, phase B, phase A. All ends of one side of the winding are tied together. And then you have each of the outputs coming off each end of the windings. So you have phase A, phase B, and phase C. Over here is a typical schematic for a generator. Here's your stator, the three-phase setup in Y configuration. You can see the output goes between the two diodes and another two sets of diodes. And you can see that only positive pulses are going to be allowed to flow up through this diode the way it's positioned. And on the bottom one, only negative pulses coming off of this winding can go down to the negative rail. So you're creating a negative supply here and a positive supply there. This winding here goes over to this one here. All positive pulses make it to here. All negative make it to the bottom. And the last one, all the way around, makes it over to here. And you have the same thing. So if you only had a single phase generator with one winding that had the ability to put out 20 or 30 amps, now you have all three of these going. So now you could have 20, 40, 60 amp output, or you could have 30, 60, 90 amps. And that's how this works to give you more power using a three-phase output. And as you can see, the rectified output goes directly to the battery to charge it up. And some of the power generated from the stator also goes into a diode trio. And that's what supplies power to the field or the rotor, which creates a magnetic field spinning inside the stator. When you first start the engine, power from the battery is going to be used to magnetize that rotor. Once it's spinning fast enough, it's going to be taking the power from the stator going through the diode trio to power the field or the rotor. Now in order to charge a battery in your vehicle, when it's fully charged, it's roughly 12.55 to 12.65 volts. You need a higher voltage in order to push that current into the battery. So most of your alternators are going to have an output range between 13.8 and 14 and a half volts. So while your vehicle's idling, if you were to measure voltage at the post on the back of the alternator to the ground or from the battery positive to the battery negative, if you give the engine just a little bit of gas to get the RPMs up to around 1500 to 2000, you should see that higher voltage between 13.8 and 14.5 volts. If it's above that, you have an overcharging condition and that's not good. It's going to heat up the plates in your battery. You're also going to boil the sulfuric acid electrolyte in your battery, giving off excessive hydrogen gas and possibly damaging the plates. Usually when that happens, when you have an overcharging condition, it's because of a fault in the voltage regulator circuit. When a heavy load is applied to the vehicle, such as an AC compressor or a cooling fan or a sound system, the voltage of the battery is going to drop. The voltage regulator circuit is going to detect that, and when it detects it, it's going to be supplying more current into the field or the rotor. When you have more current flowing into the rotor, it's going to make a much stronger magnetic field within that stator, and it's going to increase the power output. If the regulator sees that the battery voltage is fine, it's not dropping, it's pretty stable, at or near a full charge, then it's going to greatly reduce the amount of current flowing into that rotor. When the current is reduced, the magnetic field of the rotor is reduced, and that's going to reduce the output in the stator windings, which lead back to the battery to charge it. If you go to measure the output voltage of the alternator at the post or at the battery, preferably the post of the alternator, and you observe at 1500 to 2000 RPMs, that the battery voltage is staying about the same. That could be a fault with either the voltage regulator circuit. You can have a problem with your diodes being shorted. You can have a problem with the rotor, the slip rings making poor connection because the brushes are worn out. Or you can have a problem with the diode trio. All of these are very easy to test. The ones that you would test would be the rotor to make sure the brushes are right. You can check the rectifier diodes. 
and you can check the diode trio. If all of these test OK, then you notice the voltage regulator, that's the problem. OK, now that I explained everything to you, let me take this cover off the alternator, and I'll be right back. With the cover off, you can now see the entire voltage regulator. Now the voltage regulator, right inside these little tubes, is where you have your brushes with the springs, and it pushes on the slip rings of the rotor. Now if you want to make sure that there's contact being made with the regulator and the rotor, you're just going to measure right over here for low resistance using your digital multimeter. It's usually around 2 or 3 ohms. If you measure for resistance between here and here, it'll confirm that a connection is being made between the voltage regulator and the rotor slip rings. Okay, my meter is set for auto range. I'm going to touch between here and there. And you can see it's two and a half ohms. Just remember to rotate the pulley on the alternator while checking to make sure that contact is always being made between the brush holder and the rotor slip rings. Now I'm going to pop off the regulator. Okay, here's a look at the regulator removed from the alternator. You can see the transistor right here. This is the back side. This cap removes, making it easy when you go to reinstall this on the alternator. You can see the brushes. These need to be pushed all the way in, up against the slip ring of the rotor. Over here is the slip ring. One band and the other copper band goes to the windings inside the rotor. Resistance is going to be the same as before or very close between 2.5 and, and 3 ohms. To ensure that the windings aren't shorted out, you want to take your digital multimeter on a high resistance range in the millions of ohms. You're going to take one of your digital multimeter probes, touch it to the housing where it's nice and shiny like right here inside, and take another probe and touch it to either one of the rings and make sure there's no reading showing up on the meter. If you see any kind of a reading at all, that's going to indicate the windings on the rotor are making contact with the metal and that's not good. You're going to want to replace the alternator. If you remember from the schematic, I told you the rectified output from the six diodes goes to the diode trio and then over to the regulator. Right over here, this metal surface one would be a negative, one would be a positive. And you can see, well maybe it's hard for you to see, but there is metal inside of here. So the power supply right here from this rectified output connects directly into the regulator. Over here you can see the six diodes and you can see the specially designed aluminum heat sink. It's going to dissipate all the heat generated by those diodes. You have one right here, another one there, another one here, and then you have three more that are backwards on the back side of this plate, which I'll show you in a minute. Right there's one, that's the other one, and this one. So you have all six over here, this connection, that connection, and this connection are all the outputs from the stator, each one, phase A, phase B, and phase C. Testing these diodes is very simple, I'm going to show you in a minute. Now a common symptom of faulty diodes would be reduced power output, no power output, or your alternator drains your battery down overnight. When you go to check the diodes, make sure your digital multimeter is set to the diode testing setting. You can see the little symbol right here of the diode. You're going to hold one side on the metal, and you're going to take the other probe and touch it to the wire coming off of the diode. Now this can that's stuck inside this piece of metal, has a wire sticking straight out the back, and we're going to be touching this one right here. The can is mounted underneath, and the wire is pointing the camera. So you touch that, and you can see we have about a half of a volt forward voltage. So far, so good. You're going to switch the probes and repeat the test, and you should see absolutely nothing. If you get a reading in both directions, you're going to know that diode is faulty. You're going to repeat the test for all six diodes. 
Make sure they only conduct in one direction. If you see that it does not conduct in either direction, that's also going to be indicating that the diode is faulty. You're going to have to replace this entire section with the diodes in it. Okay, I'm now going to desolder the connections here. Phase A, phase B, phase C. Pull off the diode block right here. And I'm going to open up the alternator. Okay, the cover is off on one side. And here, you can see the wire from the diode right there is one of them. Here's the body of the diode. Another one right over here. And there's the body of the diode. And here's all the connections from each phase. And this is what it looks like. Under the cover, you have a sealed bearing. If you have to change this, you would use a two or three jaw puller. It would hook underneath go right against here and you would tighten this down where the top of the puller is and it would slide this off the shaft. Take the new one, slide it over the slip ring, it'll stop right over here, take a socket, the diameter of the inside of the bearing, place it over, tap down until the bearing is fully seated. On the rotor, which you can see right here, this is not moving, has a cooling fan built into it and there are fingers that extend down off of each end of the rotor. When current is applied to the slip ring, this becomes an electromagnet, and one end of this magnet is going to be north, and the other end is going to be south. You can see in this image right over here what the rotor looks like when it's removed from the alternator. It has fingers that extends down from each end of the rotor, and you have a north, south, north-south configuration as the rotor turns inside the stator. Now upon closer inspection it looks like this particular rotor is not star configuration for three phase but it's delta configuration. The difference between the two one is designed to give you a higher voltage output with lower current and the other one will give you a lower voltage output with higher current. You can see it looks like the manufacturer of this one doubled up on the wires because I can see two going in one direction, two going into another opening, two together into one opening. So it was just doubling it up to allow the windings to handle more current, but you're going to test them exactly the same way. When you check with your digital multimeter, you want to measure resistance between this one here and that one. You should get a low reading of around 0.1. To 0.2 ohms, then you want to measure between this one and that one, and then you want to check between this one and that one. All of them should be very similar in the readings that you get. If you don't get a reading between one set, that would indicate an open winding, and you would have to replace the stator or the alternator. Once you confirm the windings are okay between each one of these phases, the next thing you want to do is set your digital multimeter to a high resistance range measuring in the millions. You want to take the probe and touch it to one of these, take the other probe to the housing, and you should not see any reading on that digital multimeter. If you do, that's going to indicate one of these wires, the enamel is damaged, and it's making contact with the housing, and that's not good. You're going to want to swap out that stator or the alternator. And in this image right here, you can see the windings wrapped around the rotor and the finger pointing up from the other side of the rotor. And that's about it. There's not much else to show you. Hopefully there's enough information contained in this video to help you in the future if you ever have a problem with your alternator. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to rate thumbs up, subscribe, and post links to this video on other websites and blogs. Also be sure to check out my video playlist as well. Thank you very much for watching.